We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can. I'll write it and we'll do it live. Hello. This is Dylan Moore and Eva Bajor of Irina TV here doing it live on Easter Sunday. Happy Easter, everybody. It is April. of Jesus from the dead, right? But we are also here because of a funeral. Somebody has died, and if you haven't heard it in the news, it is the U.S. dollar. We are here mourning the death of the U.S. dollar, and Nima, I see you're not even wearing black. What's yeah, that? Because it didn't happen, I guess. Oh, oh, it didn't happen? <laughs> Wait a minute, what? All my news sources all agree, Nima, that the dollar... It, it, it's on its way out. It's over. So what harebrained idea do you have sit, sitting over there telling me that the U.S. dollar is not dead? You know that site Bitcoin Obituaries? What's that? You know that website BitcoinObituaries.com, I think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they should do a dollar obituaries. Uh it would be much more, I think, actually. Uh, Neem is referring to there's a website of uh, that keeps track of like all the articles where people said Bitcoin is officially dead over the last decade, which obviously ha- has it come true. <laughs> oh, 99bitcoins.com. Yeah. Bitcoin has died 473 times. Yep. Every time it goes down a little bit. It's dead. Someone proclaims it dead. Oh, there was a, a March 14th is the most recent one. Sayonara, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Eulogy made by Robin Brooks. Who's that? Who's that idiot? So it turns out that Bitcoin is just another bubble asset that blows up when the Fed gets serious about hiking interest rates. Zero store of value function, zero diversification benefit, zero yield. Sayonara, Bitcoin. Wow, he must have just started looking into it. Yeah, zero yield, Anima. Zero yield. It's true. It's true. There is zero yield. It's not. It's not a dividend-paying asset. Oh, I see. It's supposed I see, to be. I see, I see what you mean. Yes. So, I'm. I, the 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 word. He's out- a chief economist. <laughs> the chief economist of the Global Association of the Financial Industry. Yeah, but they're all like that. We talked about this. We, you know, right. we discussed Richard Werner. We sh- we should go over his article at one point. No, it's, it's all yeah. It's all these these very important people, the VIPs, uh, the very serious people, as Mike Norman says, the VSPs with their suits and their ties and their. I mean, look at this guy. This is like. <laughs> You can trust a John face like that when it comes to uh, economics. Yeah, that is. The, Looks the, like a friendly John Greenblatt. That that is the name that came to my mind as well. <laughs> no, I, I think at, for a future show we should go over that article from uh, Professor Richard Werner when where he just like puts eight separate nails in the coffin of the um, classical or orthodox economics understanding of economics, like he. He takes like the the eight pillars of the, the that the Federal Reserve goes by or whatever, and then just destroys them, right? Single handedly, and all these all these expert economists of the something global world fit and fit and association that they're all ascribed to this this ridiculous, retarded understanding of how economics works, which I guess you know works right into what we're going to be talking about right here so i'm i'm hearing i'm i'm hearing these stories it looks like brics which technically isn't a thing the brazil russia india china and south africa oh they're going to they're going to make a new currency and that's finally going to undermine the dollar oh man india and china are going to trade in yuan or something or uh, russia and china are going to do ruble so, and so dollar's over dollar's just over Right, nobody needs a dollar anymore because that's all that the dollar is used for, is for some trade between India and China. And I, I, caveat here, I haven't seen the news source other than Peter Zahan referring to it. So if, we could, if that news source could be found, I'd be, I'd be very happy about it. 
But apparently, somewhat recently, Russia except Juan for like a hundred, a billion or a hundred, but some very large amount of money for an oil sale. So Russia sells a bunch of oil to China and accepts Juan for, for the, the oil. And then Russia turns around and says, hey, we, uh, China, we want to buy something from you using Juan. And China's like, oh, <laughs> we're not taking that shit. <laughs> 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 so... <laughs> Like, ooh, here comes the up and rising wine. China won't even accept it for international payments. Okay, right. <laughs> bye bye, dollar. Wait, wait, China doesn't accept their own currency. <laughs> Is that what what they did? Yeah. That, so so Russia basically lost a billion, hundred billion, or whatever oh. amount of oil this was, because they they ended up with a bunch of yuan that they can't do anything with, because the the country which creates it won't accept it. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So, so um, we should probably link that Mike Norman video. He, he he made this very, very, very clear where he said there's only one way to get rid of the U.S. dollar as a world currency. There's only one way. And this idea that, OK, China's got all this these dollars that they that they've turned into debt like oh what if china calls the debt due right which we've gone over ad nauseum that it's not actually debt but china's holding all all these u.s treasuries let's say china wanted to get rid of all its u.s um money whether that's treasuries or reserves well they could either sell it on the open exchange market which would radically drive the price down and they would kill their own investment that's option number one for China. And then if they did sell it, somebody else buys it, so the dollars are still out there. <laughs> How Or secondarily, those dollars can be used to purchase something from the United States. That would get the money back in the United States. So the only way to get the money back in the United States so it's not out being used in the international market, you can't sell it because that just means somebody else is buying it. You have to buy something from the United States because then the the export leaves the United States and then the money goes back into the United States. And then he points out, well, this would just make the United States stronger because the industrial capacity would go crazy with us you know, making and exporting all this stuff, which means that the United States dollar would buy even more from the United States and would be even more valuable. <laughs> so... I mean, with 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 the we we talked about this. I mean, mainly from this Peter Zahan point of view, the the geopolitical situation in countries like uh, Russia and India, that they're not looking that great. And this idea that oh, we're just going to start trading oil for our currencies instead of the dollar, and that's gonna you know that's gonna get rid of the dollar. It's just stupid yeah i mean uh, the, the important thing about the dollar or about the us is is that the us is the largest economy in the world by far and so what is what's an economy an economy is where goods are purchased and sold and what unit is being used to do that in the largest economy it's the us dollar right so if you want access to the biggest economy on earth yeah if you want a ticket if you want a ticket to the biggest movie theater of of the world in terms of okay, it's, I'm trying to no, do I, like I, no, I guess, it's, it's, it's a good analogy <laughs> or a good metaphor. Right. Go with it. Yeah, if you wanna if you wanna watch the 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 the, the a movie in the biggest uh, movie theater of the world, you need a ticket to it, and that ticket in the case of the U.S. economy is the U.S. dollar. So U.S. dollar gives you access to the U.S. economy, basically, and. Um, the U.S. is the largest economy and it's also the largest, uh, probably among the largest taxing authorities in the world and uh, the largest banking systems in the world. And people need dollars to pay their taxes to the taxing authority and to repay their loans to that it a banking system and to pay interest to that banking system. For all those things, they need U.S. dollars. And then there's also some trade going on, you know, some oil trade and stuff like that. But that is not the sole reason why the U.S. is such an important currency internationally. And I think a lot of people, 
who have that perspective of the, the petrodollar, they think that without those international agreements of you know using the US dollar to buy, purchase certain commodities, that then the dollar would be basically <laughs> useless, you know, and that's not obviously not the case. Well, and Warren Mosler pointed out to us once that okay, let's let's say <laughs> China and Russia start you know you know utilizing their respective currencies to trade oil. Okay, there's a difference between the trade and there's a difference between what you're saving as. So if you've already saved up a bunch of dollars like China has, and they say, okay, well we need rubles. Okay, so you sell your dollars to buy rubles to buy the oil, but you're still holding the fucking dollars because that's the valuable thing. <laughs> right? And if Russia, you know, uh, gets all these rubles and they're like, well, wh what can we do with these rubles? Because who else is exchanging rubles? They turn out, you know, do they turn out and buy dollars with it? Because the dollars, again, are the thing that allows you to access the most important economy on the face of the planet. So, and, and I mean, just, just re emphasizing if it's true that China bought oil with yuan from Russia and then turned around and wouldn't accept it for an international settlement. It, ca it can't be a world currency. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the yuan at the moment can't be a world currency for several reasons. Number one is because it's not free floating. It's manipulated by the Chinese government. You can't have an international reserve currency that's propped up by the government because that would be way too people wouldn't be willing to put their savings into that money because it could break out in one direction or the other at any given moment that would be an unstable um form of uh, uh, uh saving your reserves and also china's economy is not yet large enough for for the yuan to be the world's reserve currency i mean it is a large economy for the time being and expectations are incredibly high on the Chinese economy. And from what it looks like it is that they have been way overblown and rarely anyone takes into consideration the kind of stuff that Peter Zehan talks about that we talked about here, that their population is shrinking now. But it's, it's demographic collapse that has yeah. never been seen anywhere on the planet ever. And the first time we got the, the glimpse of that was the recent census that they finally um, published, which suggested that their population declined by, I think, something like 700 million or, or some, some. No, I mean, the fact that it declined alone is already bad enough. But well, I think it was like in the hundreds of millions. Well, it, it was about 100 million. And specifically, it was 100 million of the population that's the most important. Right. It was it was like, oh, we overcounted the seniors by 50 million. They didn't overcount them at all. It was all the people associated with this one child policy timeline, which are all either the people who are supposed to be working right now, generating the wealth of the country, or the kids th that that are supposed to be the next generation coming up to for the future. Oh, here it fell uh, down. Oh, it fell down some eight hundred fifty thousand people from the previous year. Okay, so it was eight hundred fifty thousand, not not million. Okay. No, no, no. Wait a bit. This is. Uh, Let's see, the country's population fell. So this, I'm I'm wondering, because you, you can't trust a, a fucking statistic out of a communist country. Well, right? yeah, of course. So <laughs> this is, uh, the fact that it's not growing according to their own stats is already bad enough. Right, but right, they're the, actually the, On an international level that China is admitting this is even happening at all, right. probably means that it's way fucking worse. Right. Right. And this, uh, this came out in January uh, of this year after we had already been talking about that. We've been covering Peter Zehan's book where he has talked about this is go this is going to happen. This already was basically known because the re most recent census, the Chinese um, bureaucrats didn't want to believe the numbers. So they had it redone. And this was the result. So right. they, mu they must have... <laughs> <laughs> brushed it up as as best they could right well and the, i wonder if if the number that peter zahan is reporting is like what the the spies are are noticing that china is talking it amongst itself and this is the actual like the propaganda that they publish to the rest of the world 
Oh, yeah, no, no, but you know, according to Peter Zehan, the spies aren't hearing anything anymore in China, right? So Xi is just sitting in his room by himself, according to Peter Zehan. Well, I, I, I presume there are more spies than just sitting in, in Xi's room. But yeah, I, I guess apparently nobody's even talking to Xi at all. Well, I mean, you don't get yeah. Shot. This is the kind of thing where I take Zehan with a grain of salt, you know? It's like, right. dude, seriously, you have like a. You you have like a um, bug in G's office, and you're you're sitting there listening in, and he's he's just in his room by himself, quiet, and that means that that nobody's talking to him. It's quite a leap, I think, you know. But what well, could the, be could be the case. Could be, well, and the comparison, I mean, to be more clear, what he said, they used to hear conversations in that room, and now they don't. Anymore. I know, I know. Right now, like that that is still a leap, but I think that is an interesting. Um, observation and obviously Xi has purged everything and that the the Chinese situation it's just it just looks worse and worse and worse and worse and to your point this idea that oh you know China is this up-and-coming power it's going to replace us it's going to replace us as as the, the biggest economy I mean again a communist country is going to lie about its goddamn statistics because that's what they've done from the beginning because they have to prove that the communist country is superior to the capitalist country. Right? This is what Russia has done for the, did from the beginning as the USSR, and of course they're going to do that in China. And one of the ways that they do it is they say, okay, we, we need to increase GDP at any cost, so here's all this money, go build stuff, and then, okay, we built this this high-speed rail, and all the, the, the uh, all the America's doing, because everybody's doing better than us, people go, wow, China's got this high-speed rail, and we don't even have that, and then you look into it, and they're like, yeah, nobody rides it, because it's too expensive, or I, don't, I watched a video on why nobody rides it some time ago, and it had something to do with it's too expensive, and it doesn't actually go to locations where anybody lives. <laughs> but who cares? But, it's a rail, Hooray. right? right. So, so I mean, it, like with, with China, it's <laughs> that is, like, that, I mean, that's socialist thinking. It's, it, like, it's just layers and layers of fake prestige object. So and so, we have it now. Hooray for us! And benefits nobody really. Right. But so, yay. so first of all, the, the numbers are stretched to begin with. Second of all, the numbers that are real, it turns out, oh, that was a project that doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean. This idea that China is going to be this up and coming superpower is is laughable. Oh, excuse me, up and coming superpower that's going to replace the United States is laughable. And again, if Peter Zahan is correct on this this other thing, that the Biden administration has been doubling down on everything that the Trump administration has done to counter China, on, and on top of the fact has been uh, uh, working in policy that the Trump administration didn't do, but that Trump spoke about. For, and one of the big examples, I guess, is recently the Biden administration told the, uh, I believe, the semiconductor sector in China or the, the United States, the United States citizens within that sector to say, you either have to quit that sector in China or you'll lose your citizenship. And within 24 hours, all of the, the people from the United States with United States citizenship working in the uh, semiconductor sector in China quit. And wow. if if the the semiconductor sector is Peter Zahan mentions it's built by the the facilities are built by uh, Western technology the software is coded by Western technology and it's managed by Western managers and, and this is for the the low quality chips this is for low quality microchips right and this so Ch China even, even, if, them, so. even if they steal. All the IP from all the other countries, they can't even figure out how to make their own low-quality microchips. And then the Biden administration just yanked that out from underneath them. <laughs> I mean, if that's true, like, goddamn. Well, They're also, I mean, the Chinese economy also is so dependent on resource imports. You know, they, they don't have much natural resources. So they need to import oil. They don't have much uh, fertile soil. So they need to import food. They're so dependent on so many levels that they can't really compete with the U.S. in that in that regard. They they can't, and I, I think ultimately they can't compete. I mean, because it's a it's a communist country. I was watching a, another video yesterday of a guy who who was looking at an analysis by like an econ economist or something that was correlating 
lies in statistical growth with how autocratic a country is. Nima's running away. I guess he really doesn't like this topic. Nima! You are, you are, everything okay over there? Yeah, I just, I just closed the door. Okay. So, th this guy makes his point that in autocratic countries, the government has control over the statistics agency. In democratic countries, the statistics agency is independent and third party. <laughs> right? So he gives this example. He's like, uh, you know, Joe Biden or Donald Trump can't go into the labor of bureau of statistics and say, hey, uh, mark these numbers up to make me look better. In China, yeah, they can. I mean, uh, in Russia, they can. <laughs> they, um, in, in, the, in oligarchic systems like the U.S., and the West in general, they can't outright manipulate the stats. So they have to use more sophisticated methodologies and shock and awe and psy war right. to get there. You know, so that's a so for example, all the stats about the kufit are bullshit, basically. I mean, they're mostly um doctored and fake because they're meaningless. Well, but they're not the, the they're not their method for for acquiring those statistics is flawed for, at, at the at the source level at the source so, level so by the time by the time you get the real statistics which they're real based yeah. on the, the the method collection you go here's some no statistics. Yeah, no need to manipulate yeah. no need to manipulate the final numbers because you've already manipulated the entire methodology of getting those numbers you've created some unvetted, unverified, non-peer-reviewed test methodology that produces some outcome that you uh, assign significance to. And then you give financial incentives to all the hospitals in the country, to all the counties, to every single entity, uh, political or private, in the country to report these stats. And so at the end, you get the numbers that you wanted to get, but they're meaningless. Right. And they're completely bogus, completely my, manipulated. My favorite one was... So it's a much more sophisticated methodology of, uh, of fooling the public. Right. At, at my Just side note, my favorite uh, manipulative, manipulative method of determining statistics was the fact that you weren't considered fully vaccinated until 14 days after your second vaccination. For the, for the COVID shot. So if any adverse reaction happened before that, it didn't count because you weren't fully vaccinated yet, according to the definition, right? But Just, you know, the, the, the Russians were even better than that. You remember what the Russians did with their Sputnik vaccine? No. So when people reported um, catching the, the COVID after vaccination, the Russian government just assumed, well, then you must have not gotten your vaccination. You must have lied about getting your vaccination. So nobody would report getting COVID after getting their vaccination anymore. Problem solved. There you go. There you go. So um, just to finish this idea that, that this guy put forth in this article, I, I'd link it if I can remember what the fuck it was. But it was this guy had, had this chart, and he actually based this off of satellite images of lights at night because you could say okay you could fake all this stuff but you can't fake the satellite images of the lights at night and kind of use that as a, a baseline to determine growth and there was a direct correlation between uh, autocratic countries reporting growth consistently higher than democratic countries democratic well you know what i mean right i'm, I'm using nor normie speech here but you know what i mean yeah so Obviously, China falls under this category. Give me a fucking break. <laughs> I mean, that's like taking statistics from North Korea. We have a ton of food. We have a ton of technology. And everybody has a computer. And everybody has the internet. And everybody has the uh, uh, right to the free press. And da -da 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 -da. Oh, yeah, because North Korea said so. Yeah. Well, yeah, because if they don't say so, they get shot by North Korea. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about petrol dollar again. Because, <laughs> personally, I think the whole argument of if countries stop trading the dollar for oil, which I think, as we've just pointed out, there isn't any evidence that that's about to happen, or even when Russia tried, if it, they fell on their fucking face on it. Um, if the dollar stops being used to trade oil, the whole thing's going to crash. 
because that's the value of the dollar. And then you point out something like, well, the yen is a great currency, and it, it's not traded for oil. The euro is a great currency. It's not traded for oil. The whatever currency, like, you got all these currencies are not traded for oil, and they seem to be functioning just fine. And then they move the goalpost, and they say, oh, yeah, but if they stop, if the oil stops getting traded for, or if, excuse me, if um, the dollar stops getting traded for oil, all those dollars are going to come home and cause hyperinflation. Now, leaving a subject of hyperinflation aside, which we've discussed ad nauseum on the show, Again, the only way for the dollars to come home if, is if they buy something from the fucking United States. There's no other way for the dollars to come home. And if they did that, the dollar would become more valuable because the productive capacity would go up and there'd be more things to motherfucking buy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a leap. But yeah, generally. I mean, because when stuff leaves the U.S., technically that... Um, doesn't necessarily make the U.S. more productive. That that strips uh, resources from our country. Well, actually, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying we would have to increase productive capacity to meet the, the increasing demand of of all these countries trying to buy stuff from the U.S. And we'd have to, you know, crank up our exports to meet that demand. And if we were to crank up the exports meeting that demand, that means there's more stuff to buy with those dollars because we've cranked up the productive capacity. Right. Could be. Okay. Could be, yeah. Point being, like, maybe I made a little leap there, but I think it's a a lot smaller of a leap to say, okay, uh, hyperinflation happens if... Right. That's not going to happen. There could be some mild inflation or some more severe inflation during the period of what you were just saying. If there is an industrial uh, buildup, then that kind of spending can cause some inflation because you're building goods, you're building things that aren't consumable, right? right. So you're, and, and money is coming into the country. Resources are leaving the country. We have already said that large export surpluses do contribute to inflation in, in many countries. Correct. Correct. Um, so I think... Um, the whole topic, I think people need to understand the MMT basics, right? So the, the currency of a country is valuable because there's a taxing authority, there's a banking authority that demands that money. And people have a, a rational self-interest in making those payments, right? With, in the case of taxes, you don't want to get your doors kicked in and thrown in jail. In the case of bank loans, you don't want to have your stuff dispossessed. You don't want to declare bankruptcy. You don't want to do all the things that make you look bad and that uh, force you into doing things that you don't want to do. So you're interested in making your regular interest payment. You want to have a good standing in the business community, et cetera, because that in turn is profitable down the road. So these are all reasons why people in the largest economy of the world have an incentive to use the U S dollar and international trade is not uh, the only thing there is. I mean, I think that, it's maybe it's conceivable that if the US is dollar is not the only currency or if the US dollar is not used in international oil trades anymore maybe some central banks will choose to uh to save a little less US dollar i don't know but so what it's not right. going to have a huge impact on the dollar per se you sent me some articles. You want to go through yeah, those? Yeah, point go, we go, can go pull, pull some of those up. <clears throat> Gloomy outlook for the U.S. dollar. Yeah, this is from RT. The greenback fell by another 15% against... Oh, may fall by another 15%. It may against- fall. <laughs> it may fall, Nima. Yeah, by mid 2024, so over the next year, and an investment services company says, "Oh wow, right." I think for any investment hypothesis, you can find some investment company saying something. But okay, but this one is a very popular one for for investment companies, definitely, especially the ones who sell gold and silver. Right. Despite the fact the dollar, I, I mean, sorry to interrupt you, like after the whole Ukraine war started and all the predictions of the dollar um, deflating because Russia was going on the gold standard and and was was taking control <laughs> over everything, what happened? The dollar went up significantly. That was a classic, yeah. Yeah. 
actually still have that here. Oh yeah, let's let, please let's reread this. This is all, we did. If you didn't know, we did a show specifically on this this gab post from this neon revolt guy. Go go ahead and read it, Neba. So this was from March uh, 2022, so about a little more than a year ago, right after the war began. I don't think people realized what just happened over the past few days, so I'm going to try to explain what I'm seeing. The Russian central bank pegged one gram of gold to 5,000 rubles. Uh, oh, I, I don't know if you want to read through all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Because, because now we now we can see how his prediction turned out a fucking year later. <laughs> how it's funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so pegged one gram of gold to 5,000 rubles, which never happened as far as I'm aware. Or the central bank announced that they will pay uh, one gram of gold at 5,000 rubles. Sorry, they will buy a gram of gold for 5,000 rubles, right? Which was, about, well, which was about 50 bucks at the time. I don't, what's, but, what's a gram of gold worth roughly? Well, but I think at the time, a gram of gold was worth more than that. Right, that's it's, what I remember discussing, yes. Right, so the central bank basically just announced, okay, if the gold price dips below this level, we're going to buy more. At the same same time, Putin made it so that Russian gas and oil can only be purchased in rubles, meaning Putin basically just packed Russian oil and gas to gold. No, it doesn't mean that. Using paper rubles as a proxy. Now, and then hold on, wait a minute here. Again, if what I said was true true or if peter zayon said was true about the fact that russia just paid one or accepted one for for uh, oil well then no <laughs> russia putin did not make it so that russian gas and oil can only be purchased in rubles but they, they did do make some changes here if i remember correctly they did uh make it they did impose some uh um requirements on the buyer countries that they should pay in uh, a ruble. And I think Hungary actually did pay in rubles. I don't know about other countries. But yeah, they, were, they did such a thing. But so what? It does, it does not amount to pegging the ruble to gold. Meaning Europe will need to buy the rubles from Putin in gold uh, in order to buy gas and oil, or they will have to buy directly in gold, which means there will soon be a lot more demand for rubles. Okay, hold on. But, but let's let's look at you were go, doing it anyway let's look at the how the demand for rubles has played out in the last year let's see so this is do we have a chart here can i get a chart somewhere God, I hate new sites right. with all their pop ups. Click on this and pop up at this and sign up and. Blah, 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 blah. So we have 80 uh, uh, rubles per, per dollar. dollar. Today. Let's see how this has uh, gone over the past year, right? So, or oh, maybe a little more. Let's go here. Yeah, cl click that X so I could see what's. So. Right after he made this post, it dropped precipitously. Well, so this post was March 2022, okay? So, by the way, if this goes down, this means the ruble is going up, okay? okay. So when he wrote it, the ruble was already on the, on the way up, okay? It, it was going from 83 to 72 rubles per dollar. And then what, what, yeah. what did it max out at there? It, it then maxed out at 52 rubles okay, per dollar. So, I mean, that's significant. Yeah. So for a brief moment, uh, he was right there. And we also talked about this at the time uh, that, yeah, maybe that did help the ruble a little bit. The fact that people now need to store more rubles because Russia might might demand payment in rubles. Mm -hmm. Possible. I don't know. You know, it could, decrease, it could increase uh, the liquidity preference for rubles and for people to hold rubles in their bank accounts for no other reason than being prepared to pay for oil right it's possible so it went down to 52 and then that was it from june 22 onwards just to locked. the day it went right back went right it went back. back to where it was yeah it went actually above where it had been for most of you know the time prior to the war with with the ukraine um and even if we go longer term you know, it's actually at almost at an all-time high going back. You mean well, all-time low in terms of low, all -time all -time low. low yeah, value? Yeah, yeah. Uh, going back uh, 20 years or more, the ruble is now um, almost back at, at all -time, uh, an all-time low. So 
um not exactly he said um okay we'll get there currently the forex rate for rules of dot dollars is about a hundred to one um, that's, that's a far cry from 80. no yeah so so maybe he ballparked poorly i don't know but with five thousand rubles not now equaling one gram of gold and oil being priced directly in gold which didn't happen you're going to see a massive price disruption in these forex, forex markets in terms of how much gold a dollar can actually still buy foreign countries wait, holding wait, wait, our wait, wait. We, do we need to look up how the price of gold compared to the dollar happened yes it, it has gone up a little bit so but i thought i thought his prediction was it was going to go down oh no i guess if the price of gold goes up that means the dollar in quotes gets weaker i mean the price of gold has fluctuated quite a bit you can look at uh we can look at uh for example the g gld is a good proxy a gift gold. for you nima <laughs> is the gift no more pop-ups fuck hey there's a website that has no pop-ups We'll talk about it later. Um, so over that same time period, gold has kind of, oh, what do we have here, March 22. Yeah. It's actually, it first went down a little bit and it's now back up. So it, it, gold is doing pretty well right now. So um, it's near an all-time high now in dollars. Foreign countries, uh, sorry, but with... But with 5,000 rubles now equaling one gram of gold and oil being priced directly in gold, you're going to see a massive price disruption in forex, forex markets in terms of how much gold a dollar can actually still buy. Yeah, the gold price has gone up a little bit. Boo -hoo. Yeah, but Big deal. I, I wouldn't call it a massive price disruption. No, no, no. Very no, consistent it, it, with what we It gets better. Yeah. It gets better. It gets better. Foreign countries holding our dollar debt notes in reserve will see less of a use for them and will want to start dumping them in order to get something more stable, something which holds its value. Basically, any currency pegged to gold will fit the bill, which means those countries, countries like Japan, will be dumping their dollar debt as fast as they can. Oh, because They're that happened. Not, that totally happened. They're not going to go down with the ship, and they will move into more stable currencies, like the ruble. Yeah, very Except stable. they didn't, uh, because the ruble actually went down uh, throughout most of the past year which will have a deflationary effect on the ruble, making it more valuable over time. Nope, it's actually at an all-time low, which means Putin will be able to repack the ruble to gold at whatever rate he wants down the line. It's 5,000 rubles today. Tomorrow it might be 500, and then 100, and then 10. And then I want to reiterate something I said the first time we did this, because there's this, there's this total naivety, naivete on what would happen if a country were to actually do this, right? If, if, if you're repaying the ruble to, um, I should say, fewer and fewer rubles to the same amount of gold, what that's saying is that someone who has rubles can now walk into Russia and get more gold for those rubles, <laughs> right? And so basically, if, if Russia, in quotes, made this gold standard where, where – and I mean my understanding of a gold standard is if I come up with your, with your currency, you got to give me gold – they would just be making it easier and easier for any given player to empty their entire gold reserves. Yeah. But by showing up with fewer and fewer rubles. I mean, it's just like fucking retarded that somebody would, that a country would try to do that. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Um, so anyway, I mean, just the ridiculousness of, okay, 5,000 rubles per gram today, tomorrow 500, 100, and then 10. So somehow be, by declaration, Russia is just going to change the global gold price. It's ridiculous. It also means all those excess dollars being dumped by foreign nations are about to come home and cause even worse hyperinflation. Like than I we're just seeing. said, like I just said, right? But again, exactly. the only way they can come home is if they buy something in the U.S. Selling it on the forex doesn't make them come home. Right, right. If people buy stuff here, then um, the money comes back here and ends up in American bank accounts. And it'll boost our exports. It'll boost GDP. It could cost a little bit of inflation. It'll, it'll boost private sector debt savings. It will do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that, that uh, aged is about as well as we thought it would.
when we did a show on that <laughs> last year. So I guess I guess one one point for us on that. Good on us. Uh, okay, so we're reading some other article here. Okay. Anyway. The U.S. dollar could weaken by as much as 15% against major world currencies over the next 18 months as inflation continues to cool, allowing the Federal Reserve to loosen its monetary policy, according to Eurizen SLJ Capital. Th this is so <laughs> economic word salad. Right. right, it's so convoluted. It's like, okay, if inflation cools, that means that the dollar actually buys more, so it makes the dollar worth more, but then because then that will lead the Fed to lower the interest rate, and as we all know, the interest rate is what determines our inflation rate, right? So if the Fed cuts the interest rate, then that will make the inflation go up, and yay, I have a, I have a uh, theory. I, I just want to say something before you keep reading. Normally... There's a really, really big indicator in the first sentence of this article that you shouldn't even read it, and it's the word could. <laughs> the dollar could weaken. Yeah, it could, so you're not – no, no, I, I, I want to keep reading it. I'm just saying in general. <laughs> Paul Patrick, yeah. I, I'm just saying in general, like w when you're perusing and deciding whether or not you should read an article, if the first sentence or the headline is like, this may happen or this could happen, it's – it's I, I don't know if fake is the right word it's it's just total conjecture um yeah i mean to be fair what it, it is actually in in investment uh, uh jargon it's actually a little more prudent to um to talk about these things in this manner right well, okay well, let, let, let me let me modify what i said then if if correct me if i'm wrong they should say could likely happen is uh, uh, organization is predicting that this will happen i think would be the, the correct right. language to use oh, this could happen yeah good good um <laughs> so just uh, i just want to elaborate a little bit on my theory as to what causes currencies to go up and down sure and uh, at least a big part of it i think is the is the real inflation, uh, sorry, the real interest rates. It's kind of similar to gold. Um, if, let's say, let's say we take two hypothetical, let's say we take the US and Europe. Let's say their their currencies are both one-to-one -one right now. And the US inflation rate is uh, uh, 4% and the interest rate is 5%. And let's just say, for simplicity, the same is the case in Europe. Inflation is 4%, interest rate is 5%. Okay, then the real interest rate in both countries is 1%. Make sense so far? So far, so good. So, because inflation 5%, sorry, interest, I earn 5%, but my money is, is worth 4% less, so I've uh, gained 1% in real terms over the years. So, $100... Uh, uh, over the course of a year, uh, I get one hundred five dollars, and but inflation was four percent, so it's really only one percent uh, interest rate. Now, if the U.S. Uh, uh, low, if the U.S. raises their interest rate to five percent and Europe does nothing, then the oh sorry, if the U.S. raises their interest rate to six percent and Europe does nothing, then the real inflation in the U.S. goes up to two percent. And in Europe, it's still 1%. So now there's more demand for US dollars and euros will move into US dollars because... I can have a higher rate of return. In, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Or what could happen is, let's say, the, uh, the interest rate in the US goes up from... Um, Oh, sorry, the, the inflation in the U.S. goes down from 4% to 3%. Okay, now, once again, we have a real inflation of 2%, which is better than 1% in Europe. So money will move over from Europe to the U.S. So this kind of stuff happens all the time. Every ticker a second uh, on every market. Um, and inflation numbers are announced every once in a while. And inflation expectations are constantly bet on by betting markets. So you can get kind of a sense for if inflation goes up in one country way more than another country, 
interest rates staying the same in both countries, then it's likely that the currency in the country with the higher inflation is going to come down in, in comparison to the to the currency in the country with the lower inflation. So it's kind of like the same with gold. Um, we've actually presented empirical data for this where the US, sorry, the gold price does well when the uh, interest or the real interest rates are low because a lot of people buy gold when their bank account doesn't pay any money you know right um versus if the bank account pays a lot of money then there's more incentives to sell gold and um put it back in the bank account anyway going back to uh, what, what these guys are writing so i mean honestly to be fair this particular article that you sent me it says gloomy outlook issued for the U.S. dollar, but then here it says it may fall by 15%. Okay, I mean, that happens on occasion. These currencies fluctuate all the time, big deal. In fact, the dollar has gone up. I mean, it, 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 it has gone up so much against the euro, right? If we look at U.S. dollar or euro, that it's entirely possible that it's going to go, oh boy. It's not a USD. Entirely possible that it's going to come back down a little bit. US, I'm just pulling up US dollar, euro. So 1.09 right now. Man. When I was in Europe, it was totally the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I was in. <laughs> when I, well, when I was. When I came to the US in 2003, the euro was worth like a dollar fifty or so. Yeah, I bet that was and, pretty. And now it's like a dollar or nine. So let's just see if five years. Okay, so um, from twenty twenty in, in December twenty twenty, it was a dollar twenty one dollars for a euro, and then by October twenty twenty two, it was. 98 cents for a euro so the dollar has gained massively throughout 2022 2021 even, even though the euros come up a little bit it's still significantly lower yeah than it was before so so then this was a drop of like 20 percent or so for the euro and a gain for the dollar of about 20 percent a little less than 20 maybe 15 percent so they're basically just saying, okay, it could go back to where it was before. You know, it's not really gloomy. It's just, <laughs> it's a fluctuation. A research note released on Tuesday by the firm's chief executive, Stefan Jen, said the U.S. Federal Reserve is likely to, is likely close to or already beyond peak hawkishness, meaning that rate cuts are on the horizon. That's possible because, because according to the betting markets, seems like they are done raising rates um we can have a look at that we get an inside look into what i look well, at and, and then while you're looking that up one more time to re-emphasize that whether or not the, the federal reserve raises rates is entirely a political move right it, 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 I, it, I mean it, they, they could decide to put it up or down for whatever fucking reason that they want yes but we know that they use the uh, they, they look at the inflation rate right they, they kind of do do that they look at the inflation rate because they think that raising the rates fights inflation and dropping them exacerbates it but you know as we discussed many times that's all bullshit <laughs> okay um let's see here these are the expectations for the next meeting okay so this means because the current target rate is 4.75 to 5 yeah, yeah, what are we looking at here Diva? I've, i haven't seen this website before yeah so this is the, the cme group i think it's a chicago mercantile exchange they have an instrument where people bet on what they think the fed will do at their next meeting right so people put, putting their own money down to bet on what's going to happen so currently um, Twenty-eight percent of people think that the Federal Reserve will stay at the current rate, which is four point seven five to five percent. That's their range, and seventy-one expect that they'll raise it by zero point two five percent to five to five point two five percent. 
Okay, that's the May me meeting. Then in June, in June, people are starting to. It's a small number, but there's a small number of people starting to bet that they're going to go down. Yeah, they're actually, so, so in June, the majority thinks they will stay the same. It's seventy percent of people think stay the same, and thirty percent think that they'll actually drop the rates by 0.25 basis points. And then in July. Oh, yeah. People are even betting that it's going to drop 50 basis no, points. It, it, the point is like no more raises here so far. June, July, no more raises here. So we're it seems like it, this 5 to 5.25%, 5 currently the market thinks we're maxed out at that level. We're not going above that level anymore. Actually, the possibilities now for the next quarters and months are that the rates come down to as low as 4%, even though that's a low probability right now. Most people think that we're going to end up... So if we go by the majority decision, it looks like there's going to be one cut in July. It's going to peak at 5, and then yeah. there will be a cut. It seems a to cut be a majority decision. Uh, yeah. yeah, a cut in July to... Um, so Pat, they're going to stand Pat in June 14. They're going to cut on July 26. They are going to then keep staying at even they might even go lower here in September to 4.5 percent. That's an almost equal possibility as staying at 4.75. And then let's see November, December. The probabilities. I mean, it looks like they're expecting rates to go down. And there's also something called the dot plot chart, which is pretty cool. You can look at it here. Um, it, this is basically what, what we just looked at and, and expressed in a chart, kind of. So this is for, and, and for year instead of... Yeah, I don't know. Month. Yeah, actually, this is a very long-term chart. I think there's also some but chart... The, but under. the point is, the long-term chart here is, is the the... The betting community is betting rates going down in the long term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Significantly. That's what they're thinking right now. Right, right. So that's what they're thinking. And that's also that explains to you why treasury 30 year treasury bonds pay a higher rate right now, a lower rate than like a three month treasury. Because people think that once you have to reinvest those three month treasuries, the rates will be lower. So some people lock in their. 30 year rate of 3.6% or whatever. Um, but yeah, so going back, um, there's a fair reserve slightly beyond. So, so yeah, so these rate cuts, you know, if, if you recall what I just explained, uh, the real interest rate, if a real interest rate goes lower, then it is possible. And meanwhile, in other countries, they remain higher. You know, it's possible that some people will move out of some dollars and change their portfolio composition to hold some more other currencies because the relative differential between uh, interest rates and inflation is more favorable in, in other currencies. Right. So that is entirely possible. Um, the Fed's nine previous hikes, in addition to the tighter credit conditions caused by the U.S. banking crisis, um, Okay, so we talked about this. There is no banking crisis, but okay. Already suggest inflation is trending to the downside, he concluded. We expect U.S. inflation to continue to decline at roughly the same pace as it rose in 2021 and the first half of 2022. So then in, in turn, that could boost the U.S. dollar, right? So if inflation comes down, as rates come down, the differential, as I just explained, it stays the same, right? Mm -hmm. So the real interest rates don't change. So then it could have no effect at all on the U.S. dollar. Historically, there has been scant evidence of downside stickiness in inflation, even if there's evidence of downside price and wage level stickiness, Jen wrote in the note cited by Business Insider. The already subdued level of economic activity in major parts of the world will ironically likely prevent global demand from collapsing, which points to a significantly weaker U.S. currency, the analyst argued. Wait, what? Why does that point to a significantly weaker U.S. currency? The subdued level of economic activity in major parts of the world, ironically, will likely prevent global demand from collapsing. So what he's saying is that uh, because um, economic activity is low now, um, 
that it that the demand will likely go up in the future. But why why would that point to a significantly weaker U.S. currency? Good question. <laughs> I lost track of I lost track of. Uh, so the already so what are you saying? The already subdued level in the world, right? So we're already very low. So he's saying global demand can't collapse anymore. Right. So it'll go up. So but if global demand goes up, why does that hurt the U.S. dollar? Uh, yeah, I don't. I'm not quite sure. I follow there. Uh, the U.S. dollar index, which me measures the strength of the of the dollar against a basket of rival currencies, has slipped by 2.46 percent over the last four weeks after 7.9 percent gain in 2022. According to Jen, in the next 18 months, the greenback is vulnerable to, to substantial depreciation, 10 to 15 percent. Stephen Jen is known for inventing the so-called dollar smile theory in accordance with the greenback. In, in accordance with which the greenback tends to strengthen when the U.S. economy is either strong or weak, but dwindles at times of stagnation. Okay. Well, uh, the key point uh, to make here is that consistent with our dollar smile framework, fading inflation with a soft landing should push the dollar into a deep trough uh, of the dollar smile, into the deep trough of the dollar smile, uh, Eurozone strategists said. Noting this could mean 10% generalized dollar depreciation this year and more next year. Um, so that's an interesting theory that he has. The greenback tends to strengthen when the economy is either strong or weak, but dwindles at times of stagnation. Let's unpack that a little bit because I find that interesting. Yeah, I um, because I, if we compare that to my uh, framework, which is... Um, when interest rate, when real interest rates are high, that benefits the dollar, and when they're lower, that hurts the dollar. Okay, so when the U.S. economy is strong, what happens when the economy is strong? What happens is that the inflation rate picks up, uh, and the interest rates are raised by the Federal Reserve. But the the Federal Reserve tends to overshoot with their rate hikes. You know they tend to be very aggressive when they don't see the inflation coming down as they thought it should because they raised their rates. As we know, raising rates doesn't fight the inflation. So if there is no other uh, reason for inflation to come down, then inflation just stays where it is. And the Fed just keeps on hiking rates more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And so that would explain why the dollar does well in that kind of scenario where the Fed keeps raising interest rates while inflation remains sort of at the same level. Right, because and the dollar goes up because because these treasury bonds are now a great investment. Because they right. pay so much. Right, yeah. right. Because they, they keep hiking their rates more and more and more and inflation remains at the same level. Um, the, the rate hikes are very aggressive. That tends to uh, push up real uh, interest rates. And so that's good for the dollar. And he also says the dollar tends to strengthen when the U.S. economy is weak. Yeah, walk us through. Okay. If the U.S. Like economy that. is weak, what happens? Uh, uh, demand uh, slows uh, domestically and internationally maybe as well. So that pushes the inflation down, right? Mm -hmm. But also... When that when the economy is weak, the Federal Reserve cuts the rates to su support the economy, right? To, supposedly, yes. Yeah, so supposedly. Um, so now we have a scenario where prices and inflation are low, and rates are also so rates are coming down more and more. So technically, I would think that depending on how fast inflation, so this is all contingent here, right? So if the inflation drops faster, then the interest rates are brought down. Then that'll be, again, that'll be helpful to pushing up the US dollar index. Well, right? And then let me add something here. Wouldn't this be true for any country? Yes. <laughs> well, it would be true. So, so he's talking the dollar right now, right. right? So, the dollar is the largest, uh, you know, it's the largest economy in the world, largest currency in the world. So, there could be some things about the dollar that are maybe a sort of special status, right? I don't know, 
but generally speaking, uh, I would say, yeah, it's probably true. Well, the theory that I'm because well, I mean, if I'm, an, if I'm an investor focused on foreign exchange markets, if I find a country that's, you know, raising rates faster than the inflation, exactly, we're going to pick up on it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So now if we have a weak economy, right, then the inflation, so, so the interest rates come down, but the inflation drops faster Then that again, that could help um, the uh, US dollar. And he's saying in times of stagnation, that's when the dollar dwindles. So that would mean that in times of stagnation, for whatever reason, real interest rates come down. Um, I don't know why that would be the case, but maybe, um, maybe, well, I, I, I don't know. I, mm -hmm. I, can't come up with a, I can't come up with an explanation for that, but is, so if, if the inflation is high, Okay, I think so. Maybe one possibility is if we have high inflation, for example, due to high oil prices, etc., and the Federal Reserve wants to fight that high inflation with with high interest rates, but at the same time they're reluctant to raising the the rates too much because the economy isn't doing well, because high oil prices uh, um, are are. Um, so are are reducing demand because people have to pay more at the pump etc the problem is nowadays it, the framework might not apply so much anymore because the us has become so self sufficient the us uh so if all prices are high inside the us it actually benefits us corporations now it actually benefits the us on the net most of the time if all prices are high in the us that did, did that was not the case in the 70s when the us was highly dependent on oil imports Right. And that's thanks to the shale revolution. So I don't know if this framework applies, but yeah, it's possible that if we have some sort of situation where all prices are pushed high due to a global conflict, that ends up being reflected in the inflation rate. But it's not really an inflation that's caused by demand pull, but it's rather an inflation that's caused by a monopoly commodity price setter. And so in that case, we have high inflation and if interest rates stay the same, then that could hurt the dollar. Now, if interest rates are raised super aggressively again, then that would tend to help the dollar again. So the smile framework is kind of, it could be that it's accidentally right on occasion because most of the time in either of these given scenarios, um, what happens is in line with what I just said. It's basically- what, And what this, as you keep real talking- Real interest rate based. As you keep talking and I, I'm consistently reminded of how complex this stuff is. On one hand, it just seems silly to me to be able to think, okay, it's it's something, I would say something kind of close to a, we figured out the physics formula for the U.S. dollar. Right. Right? right. It's, it's a simple thing that draws this graph. And, th like, there's just... It's so complex. Things are always changing. There's always new variables being added to a system. There are old variables that die out of the system. So you're just going to say, okay, we just focus on these variables, and that gives us this this smile graph. I, 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 I mean, I just feel like you're just trying to find this unified field theory for well, something absolutely. that doesn't have a unified field theory. Absolutely. People in, in the investing world would love to have some unified field theory which is never going to happen. You're, you're never going to find that because investing is based on um, humans making choices. Yes, and humans making choices, and there are no fixed um, constants like there are in physics when it comes to humanity. Right? right. That's what makes physics a little easier. You can always have nine point eight two meters per second per second for gravity, but there is no fixed component to the choices that humans make, and so it becomes. Uh, far more complicated. And then the funny thing is, you know, even if a unified field theory were figured out regarding all of this, then everyone would know that this theory exists and everyone would act in accordance with it. Which would change and the theory. Which would, it change would change the, the theory. Yeah. Right? People, would, people would invest based on that theory, but then those actions in turn impact the price of assets. People try to predict, to predict those movements try to for, yeah, we're, uh, we're back to squares them. we're back to square one yeah <laughs> right right so 
There's another one. Uh, I don't know if we want to go through the Malaysia. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring up another one. Ma Malaysia uh, talking smack here about the U.S. dollar. No reason for Malaysia to rely on U.S. dollar PM warns as yuan influence grows. Because there's, if there's anybody that I want to go to for economic advice, it's the PM of Malaysia. Let's let's continue. <laughs> In October 2022, Chinese government researchers proposed a digital currency based on a basket of Asian currencies. In late March, China and Brazil agreed to uh, transact uh, solely in their national currencies, cutting out the greenback. Well, and the, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I feel I feel like we've done a disservice here. We should actually look into whether or not China and Brazil really did that or if this is just totally blown out of proportion similar to what neon revolt did about the uh, the rubles now pegged to the gold ah. right maybe there maybe there's a basket of grain shipped for right. you on one direction because he, he didn't he didn't provide a hyperlink for that statement true <laughs> true i right, um, keep reading what maybe we can find that after after the fact also in late March, a Russian state official spoke of a new currency for the BRICS alliance, as reported by Cointelegraph. You see, that they didn't learn from the Euro experiment, it seems, right? Because that was a terrible idea. So why do you guys want to do the same shit? It would be another effort to distance itself from the dollar, incorporating the burgeoning economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. You know, these culturally very closely connected countries. Right. Should totally have a common currency. On April 4th, South China Morning Post columnist Alex Lowe opined additional resources for dollar distancing could exist. And now, as the Epoch Times Andrew Moran reports below, Malaysia has joined the group of several Asian nations trying to detach itself from dollar dependence. Malaysia no longer believes it is necessary to depend on the US dollar, Prime Minister uh, Anwar Ibrahim said during an address to the nation's parliament. Following last week's state visit to China, the Malaysian Prime Minister revealed that Beijing is open to deliberations with Kuala Lumpur to establish an Asian monetary fund. When I had a meeting with President Xi Jinping, he immediately said, I referred to Anwar's proposal on the Asian monetary fund as he welcomed discussions, Anwar told lawmakers today. And he welcomed discussions, Anwar told lawmakers on Tuesday. Uh, There's no reason. F finish that, and, uh, that sentence and I'll say what I want to say. There's no reason for Malaysia to continue depending on the dollar. So what you said about the euro, right? We saw what happened with the euro. And one of the big problems with the euro, other than just the, the whole idea of all the countries giving away their sovereignty over their own currency, is the fact that you have these wildly different cultures with wildly different economies. Well, that's peanuts compared to how different these Asian countries are and how much they hate each other. Right. Right? The... the, the they all want to fucking kill, especially China, right? Everybody's sick of dealing with China. <laughs> well, and I mean, also, uh, forget about these Asian countries. The BRICS are not even Asian countries. The BRICS are completely culturally, economically, socially, um, militarily independent countries with their own agendas, their own... Uh, goals. I mean, it's Brazil, India, China, uh, uh, South Africa, right? They're not even not even geographic, <laughs> right? And then again, this, this is just there. this is just what the PM is saying, right? This is, this isn't like we proposed a new law that this law is going through. We've enacted a new policy. We signed something with China. Whatever. This is just the PM opining. Yeah, just talking crap, talking smack, basically. Um, where was it? The concept of an Asian monetary fund was first proposed in 97 by the Japanese government during the regional financial crisis. The objective would be that Asian countries would fund the organization and ensure ample liquidity levels to weather economic storm clouds. However, the group was never formed due to U.S. and Chinese opposition. So there's now Chinese that, opposition. Okay, well, all right, sorry, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Now that several economies have strengthened considerably since then, such as China and Japan, and where things now is the time to discuss this. Because we all know China and Japan totally get along. <laughs> yeah, that's going to happen, totally. <laughs> and also South Korea and Japan, you know. Right, they, they, B BFFs. Yeah. <laughs> Anwar also serves as the finance minister Further confirmed, who also serves as a finance minister. Wow, he's got a double uh, department there. Further confirmed that the two countries negotiated bilateral trade 
in yuan and ring it after the Chinese government invested 39 billion into the Malaysian economy. Ring it? That sounds like a, a, a shit ring crypto- it. cryptocurrency. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so l- just let me opine on this again. The Chinese economy invests $39 billion. Again, they did it in dollars. Okay. Or I presume dollars into the Malaysian economy. Isn't China famous for investing stuff in local economies so they can get political um, concessions in return? Yeah, they're doing it in Africa. Right. Now, again, put that against the backdrop of Russian but uh, uh, sells oil in in yuan, turns around and tries to use that yuan, and China says no, we won't take it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm not, I'm I'm still not very convinced here. Keep going. Many Asian countries, particularly net food importers, have been negatively affected. By the greenback strength over the last eight years. Yeah, that's what I said. China is a food heavily depends on food imports. Since 2015, the US dollar index, the gauge of the greenback against a basket of currency, has mostly remained above 90 after the Fed began raising rates in March 2022. The dollar accelerated to its best level since the early 2000s. You see, that's in line with my theory of interest rate versus right. inflation differentials causing the currency to go up. This was a headache for Asian currencies, including the Malaysian ringgit. The US dollar had soared as much as 9% against the ringgit in October before pairing some of these gains. You see, so this causes their food price to go up because they have to import food from the US. But on the same side, just to add the level of complexity, these guys are exporters to the US too. So the dollar going up, when they sell stuff to the US, they get these dollars that are now worth more. So, I mean, it's it's not one side to the story. Right, right. But, but just when it comes to food, I right. think they are uh, net importers, like it said there. China grows yuan's influence. Last summer, China created a yuan pooling program with a BIS, an institution for central banks. Well, yeah, the BIS is basically, according to the global elitists, <laughs> it was meant <laughs> to be the world's central bank, the central bank of central banks. The Renminbi liquidity arrangement, RLA, would provide liquidity to countries in the Asia-Pacific region during economic turmoil and market volatility. Well, so- and then I guess uh, there's – I've got a question here because there's – originally this is, hey, they're uh, proposing their new cur- a new currency. Are they proposing a new currency or are they just pooling all the different currencies together to have liquidity available? Yeah, they're you know, discussing two different oil. things. What they're discussing here, basically, in my opinion, this is they want to create their own IMF, right? Uh-huh. This RLA would provide liquidity to countries during economic turmoil. That's exactly the IMF's mission for the uh, whole world. Um, and the But the IMF is a Western-controlled institution, basically, because the UN is... Um, Largely controlled by Western oligarchs, well, even though, yeah, the, the China, China and Russia have permanent seats in the Security Council. Um, that doesn't uh, that doesn't mean that they have e- it's an equal control kind of situation. Well, and then, let's not forget that. Okay, that's the IMF stated goal, but what does it actually do? It just enforces austerity onto countries that could have fi- typically could have fixed their own economic problems. Right. So I mean, uh, from that from that aspect. This isn't a bad idea for Asia to go, hey, wait a minute. Instead of having the IMF come in and wreck things every time, maybe we can make our own system to avoid that. But um, give me a fucking well, break as if China wouldn't control it and use it to their own advantage. Right, right. Instead of getting wrecked <laughs> by the IMF, we can now get wrecked by the RLA, for, for, yeah. which is Chinese, uh, a Chinese spearheaded institution, basically. Um, the scheme includes the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of Chile, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Bank of Indonesia, and the Central Bank of Malaysia. Experts know this is part of the Chinese government's broader objective to internationalize the yuan. In recent years, China has signed dozens of bilateral currency swap agreements, including with Western central banks such as the Bank of England and the European Central Bank. The Chinese yuan's presence in foreign exchange reserves rose 0.81% quarter over quarter to $298.44 billion 
close out 2022. According to the IMF, uh, to the IMF's currency composition of official foreign sea exchange reserves, COFR <laughs> statistics. Mm -hmm. But the yuan's share of global forex reserves was down 11.51% year over year in the fourth quarter. While the de-dollarization campaign has generated significant momentum over the last 12 months, critics have asserted that global financial markets will take a long time to accept and trust the yuan. Actually, that's a good point. That, that's just what went through my mind right before you read it. <laughs> is that, okay, there's a difference between de-dollarization and creating this uh, pool of various Asian currencies. Just because you created this pool of various nation currency, uh, various Asian currencies, why does that decrease the demand for the dollar? Right. Right? Because the, the dollar still does what it does before. You pulled some currency together. So what? Right. Uh, it would, like I said, it is, to me, conceivable that there is a slight decline in the demand for holding U.S. dollar balances if you now need to hold balances in yuan to buy some stuff from somewhere you know right. it's conceivable but it doesn't really amount to some giant um shift in balances or some giant change in the balances necessarily in my right. opinion and then don't don't forget ultimately the value of any currency is what you could buy with it in the home of that country yeah and I, I've, I've got a funny example i remember when i was when i was living in austria I was uh, hanging out with a family that I had befriended, and they told me about driving through Bulgaria on the way to Turkey after Bulgaria had had re recently gotten, you know, communism was done in Bulgaria. And they said that when they entered Bulgaria and they showed their visa and passports and stuff, they were required to purchase Bulgarian currency. And so they're driving through Bulgaria, and they go into a store, and they said, well, let's use some of this stuff. There was nothing for sale at the store. So they, they had this Bulgarian currency, and they couldn't do anything with it. So obviously, <laughs> it, was, it was the Bulgarian <laughs> idea of, like, we need some different currencies because there's nothing to fucking buy in our own currency. Right now, if, yeah. we, if we pair that to the fact, like, OK, I just described this thing about how uh, the the. Uh, microchip, or I, I should say specifically semiconductor industry, is suffering in China. Uh, we've also talked about the fact, uh, again, sourcing from Peter Zahan, that because of the demographic collapse that's currently happening in China, the uh, cost of Chinese labor has gone up so much that a lot of the the factories that we have in China, we, United States, United States company have in China, are starting to migrate to Mexico. So yeah. if... if as these different his, historical changes are happening and there's less and less stuff to buy with a yuan, then the yuan can't be valuable to begin with. Right. Now, I, I understand that's an oversimplification. I mean, that doesn't mean there's not, nothing left to buy in China with a yuan, but if, if there's this trend of, okay, things are de-dollarizing based on these things happening, well, let's look at these other things happening to China, which may make the, the yuan a little less valuable because there's not as much stuff to buy. You're smirking. <laughs> Somebody texting you something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Irrelevant. Um... Yeah, that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, the currencies are a product of the economy at the end of the day. And it still matters what the size of the economy is and also the prospects for the different economies. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think, like I said, I think uh, there's some evidence that the Chinese economy is substantially overrated by international investors. And... Um, that will have where where the Chinese economy ends up being over the next decade or so. If the population really collapses to the extent that some uh, people think, and we've already seen that it's started happening, then there's not going to be that much demand for that currency. You know, Simple something matter. else just popped into my mind is that you know the wealthy population in China has a thing that they do where they go to another country 
Canada was a huge example of this. United, uh, they, they canceled it in Canada. It still goes on in the United States, where they, they will buy up any hard asset that they can find, particularly real estate, just to stick the money into something hard. Anything. And they're not looking for a return on investment. They're not going, okay, I get 10% here instead of 5%. They're not doing any of that. They're just moving their money into a hard asset in another country, presumably because they think in their own country all the shit's about to come down and the, and their money's going to be worthless, right? <laughs> so if their yeah. own population is behaving in that manner, I don't know, just, a, just another variable to consider, Nima. For sure. And I, 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 again, I, I just keep thinking like, okay, let's say – China and South Korea and Malaysia and Vietnam and Hong Kong and Japan all get together and they make this Asian International Monetary Fund. Like, gee, what area of the world is known for being notoriously corrupt? Just I, I, and when I say notorious, like they don't even hide it. They're so corrupt, right? It, it's like the Middle the East. intention of well, hi, yes, very good. Um, <laughs> another area would be. East Asia, give me a break. Like they're going to put this thing together in order to benefit, you know, the respective economies. No, the one in charge is going to use it to dominate the rest. And who's that going to be? China. Duh. Duh. Or Japan. I don't think Japan will get involved. No, it, if they, if they yeah, did. The, 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 the idea that Japan and China are going to sign the same piece of paper saying that we're going to mutually benefit each other through an economic union. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but to be fair, people would have said that about Saudi Arabia and Iran maybe only a couple of months ago. And um, they are actually talking now, which is really quite quite amazing. That That is quite amazing. I still don't believe it with Japan and China. Right, right, right. Because, no, I'm not saying that they couldn't sign the Literally. agreement. I'm saying after they signed the agreement, it would be immediately how do we use this to dominate the other side? Right. <laughs> immediately. And um, Japanese culture is a lot more trustworthy than Chinese culture. Right? Like if if I buy something in Japan, I'm probably going to get what I paid for. If I buy something in China, there's like a, you know, a whatever percent chance that I just bought nothing. It's going to fall apart, yeah. Right? I mean... All right, let's finish this article yeah, here. Yeah, go for it. Um, blah, blah, blah. Where is it? Where is it? Where was I? Um, however. However, while speaking at a financial forum on April 4, PBC Governor Yi Gang noted that China would install safeguards and employ measures to protect the yuan and maintain financial stability. Sure. In addition, <laughs> sure, the open market could play a crucial role in keeping the currency in check and preventing policymakers from currency manipulation. The CME group launched options. CME is what we looked at earlier, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh -huh. launched options trading for yuan futures on Monday. Cool. Wow. I didn't know that. They didn't have those already, but I guess it's just because it's so um, fixed and manipulated. There's no point in trading futures in it. This trading mechanism allows investors to bet or hedge against moves in the Chinese currency. But the growing prominence of the yuan and the broader deal dollarization ca campaign could be bad news for the international co community, says U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. Oh, yeah, we have an expert here. Rubio warned that U.S. sanctions would become worthless over the next five years as more countries aligning with China will utilize currencies other than the dollar. Just today, Brazil, the largest uh -huh. country in the Western Hemisphere south of us, Cut a trade deal with China, Rubio said in an interview with Sean Handy on Fox News. They're going to trade in their own currencies to get around the dollar. Okay, I want to look that up. I want to know the specifics about what they just agreed to. C continue. Right. Brazil and China signed an agreement on March 29 to settle trade and financial transactions in yuan and rials, effectively abandoning the U.S. dollar. Where's the link? Sorry. They're creating a secondary economy in the world totally independent of the United States, Rubio added. We won't have to talk about sanctions in five years because there will be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar that we won't have the ability to sanction them. Oh, no, we can't sanction. We can't. Dylan, is, it, is this like 
the the thought of not being able to cripple the poor peoples of the world into even more submission horrible is, horrible that's I, I, I can't even i can't even go to sleep tonight thinking about that i mean this is how these people think this is like oh my god we we can't stick our noses in their business anymore how terrible anyway but new data compiled that, that, might, that might be good but i just don't believe it <laughs> I just right. don't believe that's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, like, to, from my perspective, oh, no, they could just freely trade with one another. That, that would be great. I would have no problem with How it. How terrifying, yeah. Well, yeah. End, end of the world. So New data compiled by Bloomer. I'm just reading the last sentence without... Oh, actually, maybe I'll switch yeah, over. New data compiled by Bloomberg highlighted the Chinese that, that the Chinese yuan surpassed the U.S. dollar as the most traded currency in Russia. Okay. Well, I thought there were sanctions on Russia, so they couldn't do stuff like that. <laughs> well, it's a yuan. No, no, but, but I mean, if if oh. there's all these sanctions in Russia, and they and they, I I don't know the specifics about Russia trading in U.S. dollars, but I presume all these sanctions would well, be harder yeah. for them to trade in U.S. dollars. Of course, so of course, of course they're trading in more currencies because there's fucking sanctions. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, could, you're better at searching this shit than I am. Can you see if we could figure out what exactly the agreement was with between China and Brazil? Maybe it's too much to ask to to try to find that live. Yeah, there's some. Um, let's see. Just trying to pick a source that I think is uh, decent. Let's try this one here, Barons, which is for investors. China and Brazil st strike deal to ditch dollar for trade. China and Brazil have reached a deal. This is March 29th, 2023. So have reached a deal to trade in their own currencies, ditching the U.S. dollar as an intermediary. The Brazilian government said Wednesday, Beijing's latest salvo against the almighty greenback. The deal will enable uh, China, the top rival to U.S. economic hegemony, and Brazil, <laughs> I mean, if China is the biggest rival to U.S. hegemony, then it's looking pretty good for the U.S. Yeah. And Brazil, the biggest economy in Latin America, to conduct their massive trade and financial transactions directly, exchanging yuan for reals and vice versa instead of going through the dollar. Well, and then it, can, can I add something right here? Both Brazil and China are still holding dollars, right? It, it, it's not like they're getting rid of dollars in this process, but continue. The explanation, the expectation is that this will reduce costs, promote even greater bilateral trade, and facilitate investment. The Brazilian Trade Investment Promotion Agency, Apex Brazil, said in a statement, China is Brazil's biggest trading partner with a record $150 billion in bilateral trade last year. The deal, which follows a preliminary agreement in January, was announced after a high-level China-Brazil business forum in Beijing. Brazilian President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva was originally scheduled to attend the forum as part of a high-profile China visit, but had to postpone his trip indefinitely Sunday after he came down with pneumonia. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and Bank of Communications BM, BBM will execute the transactions, the official chi said. China has similar currency deals with Russia, Pakistan, and several other countries. So this didn't didn't answer my question i i mean like when we did the the uh, silicon valley bank you episode you pulled up the document this that this like this is exactly what california did the commissioner of whatever in california did in uh, right. uh with the silicon valley bank and you looked up the numbers and said here here's how the numbers actually moved around now i don't know if we could do that between china and brazil because you got chinese and portuguese as languages we're looking up and I doubt anybody's translated. Oh, eating my, own words. Eating my own Agre words. Um. Agreement between the government of the People's Republic of China and the government of the Federal Republic of Brazil for the avoidance of double taxation. Oh, I guess that's something different. So that's a double taxation. What, what's the date on this? It doesn't have to say a date, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, it's just a double taxation agreement. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the exact. Thing. It could just have, because it says it was announced after uh, a business forum, right? Could it just be these two people uh, having a chat and then talking to the press and saying something? You know, uh -huh. I don't know if they're. 
I don't know if there was a signed agreement. Yeah, because like I, I, I want to see the actual, like, here's how we are settling the books between the two countries. Right. right? <clears throat> and But, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, as the article cares? itself said, we're ditching yeah. the dollar. Yeah, the do- yeah. we're, we're ditching the dollar as an intermediary. So the dollar being used as an intermediary is not really that important for the the um, perseverance of the U.S. dollar. I mean, what does it even look like to use the dollar as an intermediary, right? So let's say I'm Brazil and I want to uh, uh, buy um, some some rice from China. Okay, so let's say if I if I were to use the dollar. I mean, I didn't even know that 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 they had to use the dollar pre- before this right. business for for <laughs> that. I, I, to, to that point, I didn't I didn't know either. I didn't know that maybe they're talking about like commodities like oil. Okay, let's say okay, let's say um, Brazil is buying oil from China. I don't even know if they are. Let's say they are buying oil from China. Um, they aren't because Ch- China imports the oil. But yeah, to your continue net imports. So. Um, so what would Brazil do to buy oil from China in dollars? Brazil, the Brazilian um, business that buys the oil would would go to the Brazilian central bank and exchange their real for dollars. So now they have dollars, and then they send the dollars to China, and China takes the dollars and either keeps them or converts it back to yuan. And then that's it for the dollars intermediary. Okay, so it's a wash, but technically it's a wash, I would think, right? You you buy in that currency and then you move back into some other currency, or you don't. But if you don't, then you wanted to hold those dollars anyway for for some other reason. That's what so- I was saying before. That like, okay, you, the, the countries still have the dollars that they started with, right? If they're trading with with their their own currencies, <clears throat> right? I think there's some. Um, people overestimate the significance of right, and then let's say China now has reals and Brazil now has yuan. I want to know what are they going to do with those once they get it? Are they going to turn around and buy dollars with it? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, because then technically, I would think that portfolio management is a different department than the trade management right so after you're done with the trade here's your portfolio of all the stuff you have now how do you uh save in the most efficient manner how do you allocate or diversify in the most uh effective manner possible different it's a different question at the end of the day yeah yeah so uh, i guess moral of the story here re- reading this thing about uh brazil and china is like you pointed out i didn't even realize like okay, yeah, there's the petrodollar, and everybody has to buy and sell uh, uh, oil in dollars. But I didn't realize that it was the um, everything dollar. Like <laughs> right. if if I'm selling soybeans to if Brazil is selling soybeans to China, like China has to pay in dollars for those soybeans. Yeah, that's, that's no, the way, no, that's the way it was. <laughs> No such thing. I don't think so. You know, it almost sounds like they're talking about we're going to do things the way we have been doing it, and. Right. That means we don't use the dollar, but we didn't do it before either. Yeah. Right, or or may, or maybe they're they're just like um, modernizing the way that the books get updated, right? How, how the, you know we we can do this accounting faster because we made this new these new agreements. Wait, it is yeah. at the end of the day, it's just some numbers moving numbers around. You know, yeah. it's not like dollars are being shipped from here to there. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know if we, you know, because my uh, Norman also has this video about is everybody dumping the dollar? Question mark. Um, I don't think I've listened to it yet. No, no, so that, that was the one that I was referring to, where he says that the only way for the dollar to be dumped is everybody to buy something from the United States to get the dollars back into the United States. Although at the end, he he, do, he does drink the China Kool-Aid, where he says, you know, China's the fastest growing economy, and by its current trajectory, it looks like it's going to overtake the United States by such and such a year, which I right. think we discussed ad nauseum is not the case. Uh, it, it is yeah it's uh i mean it's possible obviously right i'm not saying we we have a crystal ball but i think the evidence is very strong that the chinese economy is is being overestimated quite a bit by people and i think 
it's the, the first sort of the first salvo against that narrative was this recent demographics, uh, the recent census report. And um, it was actually kind of interesting to read that article because it sounds pretty, or to read the articles that came out then, because then suddenly people sounded like they were kind of sobering up to that whole idea of China growing so fast down the road. And, but, but I don't know if it had, if it's really hit home yet the significance of this demographic decline that's happening in China. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and then, again, I want I want to reemphasize, like, okay, so they're they're let's say they're lying about the numbers of growth, but again, if we turn around and look at the real growth that they've done, and it's like, okay, it's it's all these ghost cities and high speed rail that doesn't go anywhere and shit. That's not real growth. That's just like you said that this communist, ha ha, we yeah. built it, so we're better. Right, right, right. This hyper financialization all the way down. This hyper financialization model that Zehan talks about in his book, also, where um, the explosion of private credit in the Chinese economy just blows every everyone else completely out of the water. The, the U.S. is like a a is like looks like Switzerland. If you compare to China in terms of their fiscal prudence and their um, private credit explosion, basically. Um, but yeah, do we do we want to watch Mike Norman's 10-minute uh, video on this topic? Yeah, pull it up. Um, because I don't think it's needed. Um, and I'm going to share the sound. Let's see whether we share the sound. Yo, what's up, everybody? It is... Thursday, April 6th, and it was quiet day in the market today, but there's something I want to talk about it, and now it's it's been all over the news. It's been all over the news that even Tucker Carlson is talking about it, and I just find it to be kind of comical and kind of funny because, again, it's based on a total lack of understanding of I think just basic economics and basic reality. And that is, and by the way, this is something I talked about a long time ago. And it's a subject of de dollarization, how the world wants to get rid of its dollars because the United States is weaponizing the dollar. And that's true. That part of it is true. And I've said this many times that the United States government, the U.S. government, Washington, is using the dollar a as a political and foreign policy and even a military weapon, okay? Its ability to shut entire nations and, and entities out of the global dollar-based- Just like Marco Rubio wants. Transaction system is a very, very powerful thing. What'd you say? I said, just like Marco Rubio wants. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But that is completely separate from de-dollarization. And the, the fact of the matter is that as long as the world wants to trade with the United States, and as long as the United States continues to grow um, deficits, like uh, government deficits, it is feeding the world with dollars. It is feeding the world with dollars. If you think of, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, there's uh, somebody that, um, you know, creates more than it takes away. It is, it's putting that out there, that supply, right? And there's going to be, it doesn't matter, like, if China wants to you know, maybe cut back on its holdings, or if Russia totally has eliminated its holdings, or the BRIC nations want to establish, and or even Saudi Arabia want to want to establish their own like kind of bilateral currency arrangements. That's fine. That's fine. But the fact of the matter is, there's only one way. There's only one way that the world can. Um, de-dollarize or you know like give up its supply of dollars it's, it's not like you know country A selling its dollars to do country B it's not like China selling its dollars to Japan or, 
or, or China selling its dollars to Brazil or, or Brazil selling its China's to who knows what. There's only one way for the world, if the, real, if the world really wants to de-dollarize, I mean really wants to get rid of its dollar holdings because it feels that there's too much risk associated with the dollar. There's only one way to do it. You stop selling. And it's not like selling your dollars to some other country. The dollars are still out there. The only way to do it is to exchange those dollars for goods and services created in the United States, which would make the United States a net exporter. And although we've seen some improvement in the, um, in the trade deficit, I mean, we are a long, like, you know, 86 billion a month. I mean, we're a long, or what was it, 86 billion a quarter or something? Like, big number. We are a long, long way from seeing that go positive. There were some times historically in the past that it has been positive, you know, little bit, little tiny bit. But for the most part, the United States, because it's the biggest economy in the, in the world, it may not be that for very much longer because the growth rate, the economic growth rate in China is much yeah, faster yeah. than the economic rate. Even for it. China, with the slowdown with COVID and everything, the growth rate. This is, like I said, he gets into the... China is looking like it's going to overtake us. I think, right, I, think right. he made, I think he made his point with, oh, the dollar's going away. No, it's not, because they're still out there, and there's only one way to get the dollars back into the United States and not floating around the, the rest of the world. Yeah. I mean, two ways, technically. One is to take the dollars and buy things in the U.S., <laughs> or... They stop selling stuff to the U.S. and not earning the, the dollars coming out of the U.S. Anymore. Right, and and then have the trade deficit switch. So we yeah, let me let me let me more listen dollars to, in instead of out. Let me listen to what else he has to say. Okay, trade in China, uh, um, you know, is much faster than that of the growth rate in the United States, and and some have estimated that by the end of this decade. China will be, maybe even before the end of this decade, China will be the, the largest uh, economy on earth. And, and, and there are some predicting, like Peter Zehan, and we, we've covered that, the, that kind of the opposite happened, that China over the next 10 years, population is going to fall to something like 500 million people or something like that. Mm -hmm. and then it might become you know, the biggest, the biggest importer or the biggest exporter of its currency. We don't know. But right now, all this talk about weaponization, you know, I, I, and I'm, I was there. I was number one talking about this, the weaponization of the dollar and how as a foreign policy tool, as a, you know, as a military tool, as, as a coercive type of thing, it, it's just going to backfire. I always said, I always said that one day if the dollar loses its uh, global reserves uh, status, it's not going to be because, you know, we're printing money, we're printing money. No, it's going to be because we're going to enact policies that make it hard or difficult or impossible for countries or entities to uh, transact in dollars. We're gonna shut them out of the system. And that's exactly what we've been doing. We, we, we've been doing it as a foreign policy tool. But as long as the United States is a net importer by a big amount, and that's not our fault, okay? Countries have like on purpose embrace the model of exporting to the United States to grow their economies. We call them dollar zombies. They just, they want the dollar. So it doesn't matter like if China sells it to somebody else and somebody else sells it to say they're still out there. There's only one way. Folks, you gotta listen to me. When people talk to you about this, all oh, the dollars going there. There's only one way and that would be for 
the rest of the world to exchange their dollars for goods and services produced in the United States. And think what that would mean. So there's only one way for the world to get rid of its dollars, and that would be to exchange its dollars for goods and services produced in the United States. And that would make the United States a net exporter. And what do you think that would do for the dollar? It would, it would probably just make it stronger, right? Like, look what happened to the yen between, like, 1960 and 1980 when, when the yen... You know, when, when Japan really became like it was, you know, a major, major economy and, and became a major net exporter. So, I mean, like, all this stuff, it sounds cool for the media, which is always the, the situation, how they want to do it. Like, it sounds cool. It sounds, it sounds scary. It sounds like, oh, this is the real war that we're facing. We're going to destroy we're not going to destroy the dollar. We're not. As much as we're trying, this is the crazy thing about it, is as much as we're trying to destroy the dollar, we just can't because there's so many dollar zombie countries out there that that's all they want. And the United States economy is so big that their fortunes rest on like exporting stuff to us. That's it. That's it. So uh, you could trade the dollar. You could trade foreign exchange. I do all the time. But don't think like the, the dollar's going down some kind of like rat hole because it's not. I mean, it's just like until the day when some other country steps up and says like we are going to be the net importer and you got to take our currency. Maybe it's going to be China when they surpass us, which they will, by the way, there's no question, there's not even an argument, uh, the growth no rate, argument, if, you just, if you just look at growth rates of uh, uh, economies in the U.S. compared to China, China is going to surpass us, it's going to become number one very soon, by the way. Um, so they may have no choice because their economy is going to be so big that, you know, people are just going to want their currency. And then that'll be the day. That's it. And it doesn't mean we're going to go down. We could, like our standard of living might go down, but like Japan is not, the, the yen is not a reserve currency and it's a very affluent society. It's a very rich country. So it doesn't necessarily mean, but the way our idiot moron politicians run things here, it could very well be that, you know, when that day comes, like, you know, we're all big, we're all in for a big change. That's it for today, folks. See you tomorrow. Bye. And then, yeah, there was the next video. China just shocked the U.S. dollar. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's a cool uh, media trope. Yeah, so I mean, he just explained it right there. We di we disagree with him vehemently about the the growth of China, but so what? Yeah, his his point was even made that like even if China does do that, so what? Right. Yeah, right. Because it's at the end of the day, it's the U.S. versus the rest of the world. The dollars are either in the U.S. or they're in the rest of the world, and it's like two countries making shifting dollars around here and there that doesn't change the. U.S. versus rest of the world dichotomy, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the only way, like you said, the only way people would stop holding dollars around the world is if they buy stuff from the U.S. or they they sell less to the U.S. So it's going to those dollar zombies, right? right. So if, if, if there's fewer countries making it their business model to just sell shit to the U.S., then that would be how that would be how they if they start if they started dollar. selling it to China there you go right they, yeah. you know there's this high demand in China for all these goods and services and they decide they want the yuan and they sell it to yeah I, that would do it <clears throat> that's right Nima it's about lunchtime for me yep I think I think we've I think we've got a good run here. And I, you know, 
He still didn't wear that black. Should have jumped up and put some black on for the funeral. <laughs> no, it's the dollar. Easter. The, oh, yeah, good point. He, he has risen. Easter for the dollar. It, the dollar <laughs> is risen. <laughs> All right, man. So this has been Devlin Moore and Nima Majur of Irita TV. Check us out at irita.tv. Uh, we don't ask you for any money. So if you'd like to help us out, please like, share, and subscribe. And um, I don't know, throw us some mean remarks and we can we can wrestle. That's always fun. Again, check us out on Arena TV. We got social media all over the place. You can contact us wherever you want. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.